introduce our topic today dealing with the spiritual gifts as we're looking at the enablement that God has given to us each and every one to serve the body of Christ to make us a blessing to someone else today not merely a blessing for ourselves not merely someone who's looking for a blessing for ourselves but someone who is a blessing to others around us and if you were listening to the words as we sang through it covered several of the spiritual gifts the service gifts that we are talking about in our studies these weeks. Our text today was Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. We read those a few moments ago. Brings us back to that point of God's call to Moses in the wilderness. God took him from being a nobody who was living in nowhere to being not only a somebody but a faithful and useful tool that God was able to form into an instrument whereby the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt. God can take you. If you're a Christian, God has taken you, and by the Spirit of God is in the process of molding and shaping you and forming you into the image of Jesus Christ, so that you will reflect his character, so that you will reflect his love, so that you will reflect 
his obedience to the Heavenly Father. You and I are going through a process right now as we live in this sin-cursed world and the Spirit of God is taking the Word of God and using it to transform us into faithful servants of Jesus Christ. And part of the way that God is doing that is through the use of the service gifts. We've already talked about the seven temporary sign gifts. They are no longer being given. The charismatic movement focuses on those. We are talking about the service gifts that God has entrusted to each one of us and for which someday we will have to give an account. Whatever your gift is, have you used it? I should say gifts, for there are a number of gifts, as we've said already, that are every believer gifts. Now, we've already talked about the general overview qualifiers, the seven different principles that are important for all of the spiritual gifts. We gave summary principles last week, ending with some but not all of the gifts have qualifiers or modifiers stating how they must be exercised. Some are just stated, if you have that gift, do it. But others are stated, if you have this particular gift, do it in a certain manner. For example, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Very important. We may not make it quite to giving today. By the grace of God, we'll make it there next week. But did you know there's a difference between giving and tithing? Did you know there's a difference between giving and offerings? Did you know that there are at least seven different types of giving in Scripture? Did you know that the tithe isn't 10%? On average, it's 20%. Some very interesting things as we go through the Scriptures. So be careful on what you latch on to as to what you want to practice because there's, there's an awful lot on that, but that's just a teaser for the future. And you do have the gift of giving. That's one of the every believer gifts. We'll talk about that probably next week, the Lord willing. But the church has today the 15 service gifts. Evangelist, pastor, teacher, teacher, governments, ruling, helps, faith, wisdom, self-control, discerning of spirits, giving, ministration, exhortation, mercy, and hospitality. Most people don't think of that as a spiritual gift. That is actually a spiritual gift. And the technical terms for spiritual gifts are used concerning hospitality. An exciting gift. It's the last one we'll be looking at. But it's an exciting gift. And one that most Christians fail to exercise the way God intended it to be exercised. Last week we finished up our study on the gift of evangelists. The gift of evangelists enables certain men, not women, to proclaim the gospel and to establish, train, and oversee new local churches. Then we looked at the gift of pastor-teacher. The gift of pastor-teacher enables men, not women, with the gift of teacher or evangelist to shepherd a local assembly of believers. And we saw it stated as a spiritual gift in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. We saw that the word pastor means to shepherd. We found out what a shepherd must do from Paul's uh, exhortation to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. We saw what Peter says about being a pastor, and we saw that the office of elder and the office of bishop are related to the gift of pastor-teacher. We saw that those who are in those offices, the office of an elder, the office of a bishop, which simply means an overseer, elder and bishop refer to the same individuals. They are not separate, they refer to the same individuals, but different aspects of the responsibilities that elders have over the congregation. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. The elders are supposed to set the example. The pastor is supposed to set the example for the flock as to how to live the Christian life. How to live it with diligence, how to live it with faithfulness, how to live it with consistency. That is the responsibility of the man who is the pastor, as we call him, the pastor teacher, but also of the elders. Those who are overseeing the flock, those who are called our English word bishops. We saw that Peter was taught those responsibilities by Christ himself. And it was emphasized to him in the last time our Lord appeared to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee as they fished in John chapter 21. You remember the three different questions that Jesus asked. The three different denials that Peter had made before that and the three different recommissions 
that Christ gives to Peter, full well knowing that Peter had failed him. And Peter now in his humility understands his great responsibility, and so he passes that on to us in 1 Peter chapter 5 as to what a pastor or an elder is supposed to be like. We saw the way in which pastor-teacher or teacher is contrasted in the New Testament with false pastor teachers and with false teachers. 18 ways to identify a false teacher in the book of Jude, 20 ways to identify false pastors and teachers listed by Peter. And so we ended with the gift of teacher. The gift of teacher supernaturally enables male believers who are walking in the spirit to explain and apply the word of God clearly and effectively to the church. It's not the same thing as a natural gift of teaching. The spiritual gifts may or may not correspond in a particular individual, whereas one who has got a natural gift of teaching may also have the spiritual gift of teacher, but it is not always the case. And certainly pagans who have natural gifts of teaching do not have the spiritual gift of teacher. And so that brings us today to the gift of governments. As you know, that is listed in 1 Corinthians 12.28 as one of the spiritual gifts. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Rather interesting to me that the gift of helps is listed before the gift of governments. And you know from the way in which that verse is phrased, I explained this a number of weeks ago, it gives these gifts in the order of their priority from God's perspective. The things that are most important down to the things that are the least important. And so the gift of helps is actually listed before the gift of governments. Now that word for governments is not what we think of in terms of government today, although our English word government refers to people in the secular realm and they have natural gifts in those areas, uh, the politicians and so on. They have certain ways in which they are able to lead and get people to follow them. But that is not what we have here. The gift of governments here is a rare word. In fact, this particular form that we see in this verse is the only place that it occurs in the New Testament. We find some words that are the same word but different forms of that word in other places. But this particular place, this is the only word where governments, as it's listed as a spiritual gift, occurs. It's the Greek word kuberneses. Kuberneses. And the word literally means to steer or to steer through. It's a nautical term and we find it used in some nautical settings in the New Testament. It's used of the one who is the helmsman who steers the ship. You know, you've seen those great sailing vessels, or perhaps you've seen a film at least with a sailing vessel on it, and here's the helmsman spinning this great wheel on the stern of the ship and guiding the ship through the sea. That's the word that's translated governments here in this passage. We find the noun form of that word is used in two other places in the New Testament, clearly in nautical reference. Acts 27.11, we find the Apostle Paul is aboard a ship that is about to shipwreck. And it says the centurion believed the owner and the master of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. The phrase the master of the ship translates the noun form of our word that is here in our text. This man happened to own the ship, but not all masters of the ship were also the owners of the ship, but this one was, and he was also the helmsman. He was protecting his property. <laughs> he was steering that ship. He wanted to make sure that it got safely into harbor because his life and all those who traveled with him were at stake in the way in which he steered the ship. As you know, he made a bad decision. And as a result, the ship was wrecked. All 276 people aboard were saved because the Apostle Paul told them so that that would be as a proof that his message was true and they're cast up upon an island and you recall that story but that's the shipmaster that's the one who's the Kubernetes. we also found it in the book of Revelation chapter 18 verse, uh, verse 17 for in one hour here we have the 
uh, the second destruction of Babylon, the uh, religious economic Babylon, two different Babylons described in chapter 17 and chapter 18. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster, that's our word, every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. Lots of interesting things in that verse there, but the point that I'm making is every shipmaster, the ones who are steering the ships, guiding the ships, see the burning of this great Babylon from afar off and bewail it. That's the word that's translated as governments when we're dealing with the gift of governments. Now, you should deduce from that, and I hope that you did, that the gift of governments is not the gift of being boss. The gift of governments emphasizes giving guidance, giving direction, not merely being an authority, although there is authority involved in it. It is the one who will give guidance to the church. Now, how do we contrast that with the gift of ruling? And I'm only giving you very brief overviews of each of these gifts so that you'll understand how they're used. The gift of ruling enables each believer in a position of authority, and you remember there are four spheres of authority in Scripture, enables each believer in a position of authority to stand as a spiritual example in his or her actions. This gift is given both to men and women as an authority figure, as one giving aid, and as a servant to the church. Four different areas in which we find this gift set out in the New Testament. The Greek word for ruling is uh, given to us as a gift in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. For he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. If you have this gift, God says you have to do it with diligence. He that ruleth with diligence, you can't be a sloth and exercise this gift. You can't be laid back and exercise this gift. You can't be, a, I'll decide to do it my way and exercise this gift. It has to be exercised with diligence. Because you see, to exercise this gift properly requires constant attention. And you'll see why I say this in just a second. Because the minute you take your eye off the ball, it goes somewhere else. He that ruleth with diligence. You have to pay close attention, otherwise you're going to have some problems in the exercise of this gift. The first way that we find prohistomy, the word that's used here, used in the New Testament, and by the way, that word prohistomy, pro, in front of or before, histemi, to stand. To stand before someone or something, it's used six different ways in the New Testament. Number one, it's used of standing before someone to wait upon them or to serve them. It's used of servants. It's used of those who are paying attention, paying diligent attention to every need of the master. The master is eating at table, he drops his napkin. Immediately the servant, who's paying attention and not gabbing with some other servants, immediately runs over, grabs the napkin, picks it up and hands it to the master. He understands that when the master is about to go on a journey, he has to be diligent, pay attention to exactly where is he going, what's he going to do, what is he going to need as he packs his suitcase. Of course, they didn't have exactly suitcases back then, but you get the idea. He wants to make sure if this is going to be a formal banquet that the master is going to, he's going to set out his tuxedo and he's going to set out certain things. He has to be diligent about it. He has to have it done in a certain amount of time. He that ruleth with diligence. The first way in which that is used in the New Testament is waiting upon others, you stand before them to wait upon them, or you stand before them to serve them. The second way in which we find the gift of ruling, or the word for ruling, gives us an illustration of what it's supposed to be. The second way we find it is to stand before someone to give them aid. This is actually the word that is used of the Good Samaritan as he finds the man who has been wounded on the road and the Pharisee and the Levite have already passed him by and the Good Samaritan comes upon him and finds him half dead, takes him, binds up his wounds, pours wine and oil into them, puts him on his donkey and carries him down to the inn and gives him to the innkeeper and says, take care of him and if he needs anything else on my way back through town here, I'll pay you whatever else is necessary to take care of him. Standing before someone to give them aid to give them help in their time of need, in their time of distress. That's the second way the gift of ruling 
should be used. These are illustrations of how the word is used, which helps us understand what the gift is all about. The third thing that we find, and this is what, of course, immediately comes to our English-speaking minds as we hear the gift, the uh, word ruling, is standing before someone as a figure of authority. That's what we usually think of. Ruling. Oh, that's the king of England, the queen of England. Uh, that's those people who are in positions of authority here in the United States government. Some of them think of themselves more as rulers than others. But um, the gift of ruling does include authority. Standing before someone as an authority figure. The fourth way, which is the principal usage in the New Testament, is standing before someone as an example. We read the verse a few moments ago in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, where it's, Peter says, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples unto the flock. Not because you are the big boss, not because you have the whip, but you stand before others who are under your authority as an example of what the Christian life is supposed to be. We find it is required of men as the head of their own home in 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5. That's the fifth way ruling is used, ruling his own house well. It's prohistomy, standing before his own home as a godly example of what it means to be a godly husband and father. It's also used of women in their domain of the home. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. It says the older women are supposed to teach the younger women how to guide the house. The words translated guide the house are that Greek word prohistomy. To stand before their house as an example. Mothers, you have a tremendous responsibility, and grandmothers too, of training those upcoming generations, you older women teaching the younger women, the younger women training their children, you are standing before them as an example of what it means to be a godly Christian woman. What does a godly Christian woman say? What does a godly Christian woman do in relation to her obedience to her husband? What does a godly Christian woman do in her behavior, both in private and in public? How is that setting an example for other young women who may be tempted to be gadabouts or run around and do this, that, or the other thing, instead of being keepers at home, homemakers, we would say. You know, there is so much, I'm only giving you surface, the scratching the surface on each one of these gifts, but I hope you get the idea, six different ways in which the gift of ruling is to be applied. The gift of ruling enables each believer in a position of authority to stand as a, number one, spiritual example in his or her actions. Number two, as an authority figure. Number three, as one giving aid. Number four, as a servant to the church. That's how the gift of ruling is portrayed in the New Testament. We move to the gift of helps. The gift of helps enables every believer to strengthen weakened believers by bearing part of their workload. In our hymn that we sang right before the message, be to the helpless a helper indeed, unto your mission be true. The gift of helps enables every believer. This is an every believer gift. This is one of the ligament, if you will, or tendon gifts that holds the bones together, holds the muscles to the bones. Enables every believer to strengthen weakened believers by bearing part of their workload. It's stated as a spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. God has set some in the fir a church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. It's mentioned by the Apostle Paul in his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. Elders particularly should be exercising this gift. It's translated support in this text and in several other texts. 
In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support. That's the same word for the gift of helps. To support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's connected to the gift of exhortation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, and we'll talk about the gift of exhortation, because he says, I exhort you to exhort. That's what the warning there is about. Warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Support. That's the gift of helps, the same word. Be patient toward all men. That brings us to the gift of faith. The gift of faith gives every believer the capacity to grow spiritually. That's another one of the every believer gifts. We talked about that uh, a little bit before, but let me give you a little more detail on that now. The gift of faith enables every believer, or gives every believer, the capacity to grow spiritually. It's stated as an every believer gift in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 6, which as you know, Romans 12 is the context of the spiritual gifts, one of the major passages in the New Testament dealing with them. Number two, it's stated as an expanding gift, that is, a gift that's connected to spiritual growth. Number three, in Romans 6, or 12, excuse me, it is stated as a gift necessary for the function of other spiritual gifts. So in other words, if you're not exercising the gift of faith, you will not be properly exercising what other, other gifts God has given to you. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you cannot exercise your spiritual gifts unless you are exercising them in faith. You must walk by faith. Walking by faith involves the exercise of the other spiritual gifts. So if your faith is merely an infantile faith which you received at the point of salvation, for faith is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, if that is where your faith has remained, you will not be able to exercise your other spiritual gifts. Faith enables you to grow spiritually as you begin to take steps of faith. What a joy it was this past week to see so many of my grandchildren. A delight. These little teeny weeny kids all bouncing around the house and you... you know, <laughs> I should pause and go back to the gift of ruling for a second. You mothers, you know what it means to be diligent in ruling, uh, diligent in taking care of the kids, because the minute you don't look at them, they are busy doing something they shouldn't be doing. So many times, little baby Joel, who hasn't learned to walk yet, but he sure can crawl. And boy, can he get around. Every time we weren't looking, he started to climb the stairs, because he can crawl up the stairs. Very dangerous. You know, now he had a lot of uncles and aunts around, Praise the Lord for that, who kept grabbing him off the stairs and dragging him back down. That's about the gift of ruling. But gift of faith. You want to get beyond the crawling stage. You want to get to the walking stage and the running stage so that you can run with patience the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You're running a race. You're running it by faith. It's in the context of heroes of faith. Diligently run the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. Author and finisher of what? Your faith. Dear people, if you are not walking by faith, you are not exercising your spiritual gifts. How can the body of Christ survive if we don't exercise our gifts, how can the body of Christ survive if we don't exercise this central essential gift that is given to each one of us? Because we'll spend our entire life lying on our back, whining and crying like a baby in the crib, or just barely crawling. Well, the gift of faith. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Now listen to the next phrase. It tells you, this is the context, spiritual gifts, Romans 12. It tells you that this is an every believer gift. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You've, 
got it, people. The question is, are you exercising it? If you lie on your back all your life, your muscles will atrophy and you'll never be able to do anything. And you'll never use the other gifts that God has given you. Oh, you must walk by faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all, I'm continuing with verse 4, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. He begins to apply faith to each of the gifts. It's given to every man. It's given to every man to profit with all. That is, to profit everybody else, not to profit yourself. There are these health and wealth and prosperity preachers out there that say, if you just had enough faith, you could get rich. Listen, that's not what the scripture teaches. And number two, that is a bizarre application of the gift of faith. It's not so that you can get rich. It's so that you can benefit other members of the body. That's the context of the spiritual gifts. To understand what the gift is all about, I think we need to understand what faith is. A number of years ago, I did a very long, intensive study on every place in the Bible that the word faith occurs in Hebrew and in Greek, both noun and verbal and adjectival forms and adverbial forms. I looked at every place that it showed up, trying to figure out what were the key elements that dealt with faith. And at that time, I wrote, that was back in 1973, I wrote a, an entire Sunday school curriculum. And uh, someday maybe it'll get published. <laughs> but I uh, wrote an entire Sunday school curriculum. And faith was one of the lessons for that curriculum. And here's the definition that I came up with. And even after all these years, I'm still convinced the definition is true. It's not a description. Hebrews uh, gives us a description, but the definition of faith is, faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. You don't work up faith in yourself. Faith is a gift from God. But the way God gives it to you, he reveals what he is like. And when you see that he is trustworthy, he creates faith in you that is directed toward him. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. When someone reveals himself or herself to be untrustworthy, you don't have faith in that person. When they reveal themselves to be trustworthy, however long the extent of that revelation to you is, the more and more you begin to trust them or have faith in them. The same thing is true with God. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God because that's where God reveals himself. Where he infallibly reveals himself. He has revealed himself in creation as powerful. He has revealed himself in your conscience as one who judges sin. But revealing all of his person only comes through the scripture. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. I think that if you look at every place in scripture where faith is found, you will find that that definition fits. Now we have a description of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Not the definition, but a description of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then it gives you multiple examples because immediately after that verse, we are given the heroes of faith. That's Hebrews chapter 11. But the definition of faith always goes back to believing the word of God. You will discover that every one of the heroes of faith received the word of God in some form, believed the word of God, and acted upon the word of God. Every hero of faith listed in Hebrews 11 
received the Word of God, believed the Word of God, and acted on the Word of God. Faith is complete confidence in the Word of God. Even when it looks impossible, you look at the impossible belief of Abraham, who's an old man with an old wife, never had any kids, and God says you're going to have a child by Sarah, your wife. And he believed the word of God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Legizomai imputed to him for righteousness. You've heard me talk about that. Every one of the heroes of faith believed it, regardless of how God's word came to them. In the Old Testament, the word of God came to the prophets in many different ways. It came through visions, came through dreams, came through theophanies, came to God with God speaking directly to his servants, for example, directly out of the burning bush, uh, and so forth. In the Old Testament, as each book of the Old Testament was written down, that is, it was inspired, the written word became the final authority. It never got changed as more of God's word got written. For example, we have the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, written down by Moses. After that, Israel didn't get more revelation from God that says, hey, you know, uh, I made a mistake back there in, in the book of... Uh, Genesis, and I really didn't create the heavens and the earth. I fooled you guys. Didn't really create it in six days, but over billions of years by evolution. God never changes his word. Never. When it was written down, it was inspired, and God has preserved it for us down till today. The written word of God, the Bible, is also complete. There is no more new revelation that's being given. Faith is when we believe the written word of God on whatever subject is at hand. You will find that fits every usage of faith in Scripture. Now, the term faith is actually used in the Bible in five different ways. We find saving faith. We find sanctifying faith. We find the gift of faith. We find faith as the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5. And we find the faith, when the definite article the is in front of the word faith in Greek, that is talking about the revealed body of truth that God has given to us in his word. The body of truth that was handed down to us in the scriptures and for which men and women have died over the centuries. The faith once committed unto the saints, Jude says in Jude 1. It centers always around the gospel. It is that body of truth which if you are a true believer, you are willing to give your life for it. The faith. Now, obviously we don't have time to cover all of those areas of faith. I've got four more minutes, at least according to the clock back there, if I can see it correctly. Um, so we'll have to finish up with some of these other gifts next week. That gives you an overview of the major ways in which faith is portrayed in Scripture. Every one of those ways comes back to God revealing himself and being the creator of our faith. It is, faith is not something that is internally produced as you work it up in your emotions. Faith is externally given by God. The book of Hebrews portrays God as the author of that's the point of salvation. The author of our faith and the finisher of our faith. That's sanctification. That's bringing you to full-blown spiritual maturity which will not completely occur until you get to heaven. But he's the author of our faith. He's the finisher of our faith. It's not of us. It is all of God. When we're dealing with the gift of faith, it's portrayed as a key element to spiritual growth because it is the necessary element for gaining divine wisdom through the Word of God. Now, I've talked quite a bit about how you have to have faith to use any of your other spiritual gifts, but knowing how to use your spiritual gift requires the gift of wisdom. And faith is connected to wisdom in an indissoluble way. You cannot gain wisdom without faith. Let me read it for you, James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That means different kinds of temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Did you know God is going to exercise you? I had a coach who used to exercise us. 
Now, he didn't get out there and run along with us. He was an old man. He had a elephantiasis in one leg and, uh, you know, could hardly walk. But that, that man was a diligent man. In the wintertime, when there was a foot of snow on the ground, he would go out and shovel a single lane around the quarter-mile track so that after class, and after we had done our winter athletics, I was in wrestling at that time. Some were in basketball, others were in other things. But after we had done our winter athletics, we were finished, and everybody else was finished with the workouts. He wanted to get us ready for spring track. He would make us come out and run in the cold, in the snow, on that narrow lane that he had shoveled a quarter of a mile around the track. Yes, the trying of your faith worketh patience. You have a coach who is willing you to put you through the exercises that are necessary to develop patience in you. Now listen as he goes on. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, teleos, that is full grown, complete, mature, so that you can be perfect, mature, and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. Verse 5. Now remember our context here, which is faith. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and it braideth not, and it shall be given him. Wisdom is also, as we'll see next week, an every believer gift. Wisdom is also something that increases and grows, just like faith increases and grows. And wisdom increases and grows with faith. Listen to the rest of this verse. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally. God is not stingy. And a braid of thought, he will not bowl you out for asking for wisdom. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Do you remember the description of the apostates that we talked about last week? Do you remember how Jude and Peter described them? As raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Those are not men of faith. Those are not women of faith. They're like raging waves of the sea, tossed to and fro, foaming out their own shame. You want wisdom from God? God doesn't send it to you as a lightning bolt of blue that zaps into your head and suddenly you are wise. He gives it to you when you ask in faith. What is faith? Back to your definitions. Faith is complete confidence in the Word of God. How are you going to get wisdom? so that you can walk by faith? What do you have to study? What do you have to memorize? What do you have to meditate upon? The Holy Spirit takes content and uses it to give you wisdom. It has to be the content of the Word of God. He doesn't work in a vacuum. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. Now listen to verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. It's also key to your prayer life. You're asking God. What is that? That's praying. You're saying, oh Lord, give me wisdom. You know what? If you don't ask in faith, not only will you not get wisdom, because wisdom deals with how to interact with real life from God's perspective. Not only will you not get wisdom, you won't get any other prayer requests. Have you ever prayed and the heavens seemed like brass? Have you ever prayed and wondered why God continually gave you a no answer, but you didn't understand? It's because you didn't have the content of the Word of God squirreled away in your brain. You had nothing with which the Holy Spirit could work in your mind and heart to help you understand the purposes of God in your life. It must be the Word of God. This is where He has revealed Himself, not your emotions. He has revealed Himself in the Word, not just in circumstances. The devil can control circumstances too. It's the Scripture. And you approach the Scripture by faith. 
and you ask for wisdom, that is understanding of the scripture, so that you will know the mind of God, you ask by faith, and then you begin to ask things that are pleasing to God instead of things that are pleasing to your carnal nature. Let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Well, our time is up for today. We want to start with the gift of wisdom and then the gift of self-control next week. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. Oh, Father, how we thank you that you have, by your Spirit, enabled and empowered each one of us with spiritual gifts to be able to serve you and to minister to the body of Christ. Not merely to get stuff for ourselves, but so that we might serve. Father, I pray that you will take your word as it has gone forth this day, that you will use it in each of our hearts, that you will help us to understand what it means to stand as an example for others around us. That you will help us to learn to minister one to another, that you will help us in whatever position of authority you have placed us to exercise wisely and properly that gift. And Father, that you would help us to learn to walk by faith so that we might exercise all of our other spiritual gifts for the edification, that is the building up of the body of Christ here in this place. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.